Welcome to the University of the Free States Open Access Week. Before we start, we would like to share Spark's statement on the theme for 2020. The theme for this year's International Open Access Week is Open with Purpose, Taking Action to Build Structural Equity and Inclusion. Openness can be a powerful tool for building more equitable systems of sharing knowledge. Rebuilding research and scholarship to be open by default presents a unique opportunity to construct a foundation that is fundamentally more equitable. Yet today, structural racism, discrimination and exclusion are present and persistent in places where openness is a core value. As a global community, it is important to understand that the systems, spaces of the present, are often built upon legacies of historic injustice and that addressing these inequities is a necessity. We need to examine who these spaces and systems are designed for, who is missing, who is excluded by the business models we use, and whose interests are prioritised. As we work together to rebuild these structures, we need to commit to moving from conversations to concrete commitments and to hold one another accountable for making real progress. Building on our discussions in 2018, Designing Equitable Foundations for Open Knowledge, and 2019, Open for Whom? Equity in Open Knowledge. 2020 marks the third consecutive year the theme for International Open Access Week will focus on the urgent need for action on equity and inclusion, underscoring the urgency of continuing to centre this work. International Open Access Week is a time for the wider community to coordinate in taking action to make openness the default for research and to ensure that equity is at the centre of this work. This year's Open Access Week will be held from October 19th through the 25th. However, organisers are encouraged to host discussions and take action around this year's theme whenever is most suitable during the year and to adapt the theme and activities to their local context. This is especially true for this year with the varying levels of disruption due to COVID-19. Diversity, equity and inclusion must be consistently prioritised year-round and integrated into the fabric of the open community, from how our infrastructure is built, to how we organise community discussions, to the governance structures we use. International Open Access Week is an important opportunity to catalyse new conversations, create connections across and between communities that can facilitate this co-design, and advance progress to build more equitable foundations for opening knowledge, discussions and actions that need to be continued year in and year out. Here at the University of the Free State, we have been working towards the diversity, equity and inclusion mentioned here, from increasing open access to as much of the university's research output as possible, to open educational resources and a data repository, to diversifying our academic journals and support for researchers using open practices. We are proud of the accomplishments we will be showing you this year. Here is our Vice Rector for Research, Innovation and Internationalization, Prof. Gurli Vitun, with a message about open access at the University of the Free State. When the University of the Free State signed the Berlin Declaration on Open Access to Knowledge in the Sciences and Humanities in 2011, it committed ourselves to the wide and free dissemination of its scholarship by means of open access platforms. At an open science colloquium held by the Library and Information Services in 2019, our Rector and Vice-Chancellor, Professor Francis Peterson, and Professor Ahmed Bawa from USAF, both framed the lack of knowledge or the lack of access to knowledge due to the high costs uh, as a human rights injustice, accepting that we need to challenge the status quo in scholarly communication as a nation. South Africa's journey towards open access to scholarly journals can be seen in the context of the open science policy framework of the Department of Science and Technology. At a global level, there are also large national and international projects and movements aimed at, produ aimed at producing an, an open access basis to scientific information through direct engagement with the publishing industry. South Africa's science system, although small in comparison, is large enough to make an impact 
when working in um, alliance with other national systems. In June 2019, the South African National Library Information Consortium, uh, also known as SANLIC, co-hosted a workshop uh, for DVCs, research managers, library directors, and academics to develop an open access roadmap for South Africa. At the, this workshop, the conclusion was that open access in our context is first and foremost about universal access. The history of South Africa's higher education se sector has resulted in the legacy of deeply unequal access to scholarly journals and information databases. The impact of this on the development of scholarly activities of South Africa's knowledge system is immense, and there is national consensus that this has to be corrected. The cost of procuring reading access to journals and information databases is deeply prohibitive for most South African universities and its scholars and students. This is why there is a strong consensus amongst university leaders that the procurement of research information and data should move towards a platform that gives equal access to all South African scholars and students. Of course, there is also the cost of scholarly communication. The combination of the rate at which the cost of journals is increasing the and the weakening of the RAND is rapidly crippling the capacity of South Africa's research system to guarantee even the current limited access to scientific information as we head into the future. Again, there is no question that there needs to be a change of, of the model to secure this access. At the end of the workshop, the steps for a South African roadmap included a national declaration on open access. Furthermore, discussions were based on the understanding that South Africa understands the role of information and knowledge as central to its developmental agenda. As such, it has adopted an open science philosophy as a framework for its, for its national system of innovation. An essential element of such an open science framework is open access to information and knowledge. The existing business model of the journal publishing houses makes access to publication and research data increasingly unaffordable and undermines the principles of human rights and social justice. At the University of the Free State, one of our first steps towards supporting open access was to establish our institutional repository. With over 9,000 items and growing rapidly, it hosts our research outputs as well as other valuable research content, such as research outputs by the National Museum in Bloemfontein and the COFSI's A2 rated NRF researcher in the humanities, Professor Willem Borsov's artwork and photographic archive. The UFS is also publisher to nine open academic journals. Eight of those are accredited. Journals for trans the Journal for Translation Studies in Africa is the newest title available on our Open Journal System platform, with its first issue published in May 2020. COFSI journals support the strengthening and the development of open access. All our journals share their content with a Creative Commons license and authors retain copyright. Our Open Access Week program will feature these journals and their support for the open movement. We are proud to announce the launch of our data repository hosted on the FICSHARE platform. Access to research data is becoming increasingly important to funders, publishers and research institutions. FICSHARE at the University of the Free State allows researchers to store, manage and potentially share their research data in a secure, Popia and GDPR compliance space. We are also launching our repository for open educational resources, a collaboration between the Library and Information Services and the Center for Teaching and Learning. This repository solidifies our commitment to open access and scholarship. And in support of our emerging researchers, the Library and Information Services 
and the Directorate for Research Development are making it easy for postgraduate students to create and maintain an ORC ID right at the start of their careers. There's already much support for researchers on managing online, digital and open identities at the library, as well as navigating the world of open scholarship. Avoiding questionable journals and understanding best practices in the open environment. We hope that you are inspired by all these new developments in open access at the university. And we hope that you are inspired by our program of, of this week. Today, you can look forward to hearing from Mr. Charlie Mulepu, Acting Director of the Library and Information Services on openness and the fourth industrial revolution. Stay with us for the rest of the week to hear from your colleagues and UFS authors on their experiences and recommendations for publishing in open access journals and having your questions answered on everything open access. Enjoy the week. We thank Provitin for her message and her support on open access at the university. Before we proceed with the programme, we would like to invite you to follow our event on social media. Content will be shared via our Digital Scholarship Centre's blog, as well as the Centre's Facebook and Twitter pages, and the Library and Information Services Facebook and Twitter pages. Although most of our presentations are pre-recorded, our open access team is standing by to advise on technical difficulties and to answer your questions. Should you experience any difficulties with your internet connection and miss out on some of our presentations, they will all be available after Open Access Week. I will be your host for today. My name is Gornal Skeldema van Weyck, and I've been involved with Open Access at the University of the Free State since the start of the project. At the moment, I'm managing a pilot project for a digital scholarship centre, but more on that later in the week. Today, we will be hearing from our research office, the Directorate Research Development, or DRD. Then, our keynote speaker, Mr. Charlie Molepo, will talk about openness and the Fourth Industrial Revolution. I interviewed him after a talk he gave at Lihasa on the Fourth Industrial Revolution, and we focus on how the tools can help create equity. So now, what do you look for? You look for those tools that will make it easy for them to be able for you to be able to reach them. And, and some student will have a question at the wee hours of the morning. You know, he's studying alone, he's, he's far. At 12 o'clock, he has a nagging question. Um, the, the easiest way, and, and now that's why you, 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 you see things like chatbots and robots, where people, those things will be able to, a, a user will be able to communicate with them and get the, at least the, the, the minimum information they require. So if one develops one for University of the Free State, for instance, and, and it's easy for us in the library industry because our very own nature is we, we, we work in consortium, we work, we, we collaborate, you know. So, so why would you do, develop something like that and keep it to yourself, you know? I also interviewed Ms. Jeanette Molopiani, the library's deputy director for Te teaching and learning, to find out more about the establishment of our OER platform. The importance of OERs. Right now, what we are experiencing globally with the pandemic, money is going to be a scarce resources and more information will be needed. So students won't be able to procure Textbooks. We have seen universities globally have been uh, with uh, different uh, businesses to ensure that you know they acquire e-books, but still that is still expensive. So OERs are a way to go. It will be for what the mandate of higher education stands for, to ensure that knowledge is freely available in order to build up the economies of our country so that we produce skills. And with uh, the OERs, are, you know, the, the lecturer, the way they package their content is going to make sure that our students get the right knowledge. And then the, then the knowledge that is not expensive, OERs are freely available. So it means that even the poorest of the poor, that young man, Tabo, who stays with Gogo in an informal settlement and cannot afford a textbook, 
uh, Tabo, who stays with Gogo, who lives on um, pension grants, is able to get an information resource that will enable him to be alleviated from poverty and also improve the livelihood of himself and, and Gogo. And our last interview for the day is with our new Kofsi Journal, Journal for Translation Studies in Africa. Don't miss the brand new editorial team's view on starting an open access journal. On, on the topic of accessibility and the open access, do you charge page fees? No, not at all. And I think um, that is important both on the production side for you as a young scholar, maybe, an, or an African scholar who doesn't have subsidies and funding with which to, to, to publish in a fancy journal, but also on the reading side, if you imagine that a, a good journal um, charges easily 30 to 50 euro or, 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 or dollars for you to download a, a, a paper, um, if you can get that for free and if you can get people to read your work for free, many more will read it than, than, than would read the, the high level um, stuff, I think. I am really convinced that um, academic and scholarly work should be um, available. Um, otherwise, you just continue privileging a privileged few people. If you are joining us tomorrow, we will be talking to Ms. Kaulile Khadebe, our scholarly communications librarian, and we will follow that with a live session for questions and answers on open access. My name is Kaulile Khadebe. I'm the new scholarly communications librarian at UFS, and I started um, working for uh, UFS libraries in um, February 2020. In my view, I think scholarly communication is the system through which research and other scholarly writings are created, evaluated for quality, disseminated to scholarly community, and preserved for future use. Why does it matter? My role as um, the, the, the scholarly communications librarian, um, I believe it's to contribute to the overall postgraduate postgraduate research experience in the library by facilitating a working relationship and the emerging demand of the digital environment requires the library to ensure the accessibility and visibility of the institutional research output. Tomorrow you will also be hearing from University of the Free State authors who regularly publish in open access journals, their experiences and advice. In South Africa, the research outputs are linked to incentives and they are regarded as a source of income. So if you don't publish in the accredited list, it means you may not get the, the incentive or subsidy that goes with that. Yeah. But it and influence me, as you notice, mostly my publications are still in open access. So I really, I don't focus on that much because for me, it has promoted me as a scientist. In, in the first place, you have far more journals that you can actually publish in. For example, uh, in our field uh, of plant sciences, for example, you have the Frontiers journals, which are all open access and which have a very high impact, one of the highest impacts in our fields. And that journal is only open access. So, so you have a far larger choice of journals that you can publish in. You know, with um, my passion of access to education, open access means that barriers to information is removed. As a staff member of the university, we have the privilege to have access to many, many journals through our library services. But for the person on the street, that information is not available without notable cost. I am in support of equal opportunities for people, and particularly in the context of our country, our continent, and the hemisphere in which we live, I believe it is important to have unrestricted access to information. Um, the other reason why I think it's important is that most open access journals 
will allow what they call self-archiving. So you can post your article to a website or a repository that's immediately also available on the internet. Um, this does depend on the journal or the publisher's policies. We will also be sharing our interviews with two Kofsi journals, Perspectives in Education and Acta Academica. Now, we are always in this situation, especially in South Africa, and especially with journals in South Africa, that people must keep in mind that you have a dual purpose that you're serving. On the one hand, you want to use the journal, especially because it's open access, to promote young academics, to get them into research, get them into publications. So you need to strike a balance between established researchers publishing in journals and new researchers, upcoming developing researchers that you want to uh, bring into the journal. So in, it's a, almost a tightrope exercise where you have to retain a balance that you don't, if you only publish established authors, the people lose confidence in their journal in the sense that young academics feel that why submit an article is not going to be accepted. A university, especially in the Global South, should say preference should be given to top quality open access journals, which meet all the requirements and criteria to be fully accredited as scholarly uh, periodicals. And then you should say they should at least treat it as good, if not more than those journals in commercial publishing houses where the article is uh, behind a paywall and basically not accessible for the overwhelming majority of scholars. On the 22nd of October, we will tell you more about our data repository, hosted on Figshare. Our plans to fully launch our data repository was scuppered by COVID-19, but that will not stop us from showing you its features and how the UFS will be using it. And we will be interviewing two Kofsi journals, Southern Journal for Contemporary History, previously known as Journal for Contemporary History. This journal also has a new editorial team and is one of our journals that is most diversified in terms of content and editorial team. After the Southern Journal for Contemporary History, we will hear more from Acta Theologica. I've been appointed editor of the then Journal for Contemporary History, renamed to the Southern Journal for Contemporary History in January 2019. And in a sense, my own editorial vision has been shaped by my own history of working from the sides, from the edges, from the borders of the discipline. We changed the name, as I said, and we work with a marvellous editorial collective made up of, of Jolene Kofandariri, who's the managing editor, and two associate editors, Tanasha Niamunde and Siraj Yengde. All are PhDs in history. We And while I'm nominally, I suppose, the, the traffic warden as the editor-in-chief, we mm -hmm. do try and work as an editorial collective. As I said, I come from the sort of borderlands of the discipline, and I felt that in being offered the editorship, I didn't want to, it to be business as usual. And then also on your copyright, that it's clear to them where the copyright lies. Um, it doesn't really make so much sense to have copyright with a journal if it's an open access journal anyway. And you would rather have that author retain the copyright, and without coffee journals, it's actually uh, we do use the CC BY license. Copyright remains with the author, because then that author can use more and more of his work, and there will be more references to your journal. So copyright with the right. author is a good thing. And then the other thing is having a professional website, making a good impression. If you're on a website which it's not professional, and 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 it's open access, then it kind of ring, kind of. People feel that maybe there's something not quite right here. So a professional website would also be good. And then lastly, apply to get included to, on DOAJ. 
On the 23rd, our last day of presentations, but by no means our last day of sharing content and experiences from the UFS via our other platforms, I will introduce you to our Digital Scholarship Centre, share an interview with Kofsi Journal's Journal for Juridical Science, yet another Kofsi Journal with a new editorial team, and our open access team will share with you the many open access resources we found along the way, academic and leisure. We are happy to have you with us for Open Access Week. We are using Microsoft Teams live events to broadcast our events. On this platform, you will find a Q&A box where you can put your comments and questions. Our Open Access team will always be available to answer your questions. Uh, you know, there, there would certainly be scope for that type of of research as well, and how uh, shall we say jurisdictions have dealt with the the, the legal aspects behind uh, behind the whole pandemic. So, of course, that would uh, that would certainly be relevant as well. What we would typically do then is to look at, uh, let's say, if 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 the 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 research is not dedicated to South African law. Uh, or, or only to South African law, that it would involve, let's say, a comparative analysis of of the position in South Africa with a different jurisdiction. So um, we always, as I say, strive to to um, to focus on articles that are uh, of primary relevance to our South African readership. And now I am happy to introduce Ms. Lelani Oosthuizen from our research office for our next presentation.